Uh, we would like to welcome our next distinguished speaker, Professor Asada Masahiko. He is a professor at Doshisha University and Professor Emeritus at Kyoto University. He is also currently serving as a member of the UN International Law Commission. He has also written extensively in various fields of international law, including in the fields of arms control, disarmament, use of force, international law, war and reparations. For today's session, by providing specific topics and example, Professor Asada will shed some light on the pivotal work of the ILC in shaping international law. Please join me in a warm welcome to Professor Asada as he starts the lecture. Asada Sensei, onegai itashimasu. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Masahiko Asada, uh, Professor of International Law at Doshisha University, Kyoto. Uh, I have been teaching international law uh, at three different uh, universities in Japan uh, for nearly uh, 40 years. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Japanese government uh, offered me the opportunity to uh, run in the election for the International Law uh, Commission, ILC, uh, to be held in uh, 2021. Uh, fortunately, I was uh, elected as uh, one of the 34 uh, members of the ILC and uh, my quinquennium uh, started this year. In this presentation, I will show you uh, what the IOC is, uh, how the IOC operates, and what the IOC has been working on by uh, focusing uh, specifically on a couple of topics from its past and present agendas. Uh, one that has been completed and another where work is currently ongoing. The outline of my presentation is shown at the first page of the handout, and the following pages uh, contain uh, materials relevant to my presentation. Uh, it is well known that the state sovereignty is composed of three different powers, uh, jurisdictions, i.e. legislative, executive, and judicial. Likewise, the international community may also have um, three different kinds of, excuse me, I have to uh, switch on the, the, the timer. Uh, Likewise, the international community um, may also have considered um, three different uh, powers. Executive power is mainly exercised by the UN Security Council, including its imposition of sanctions. Uh, in fact, the Security Council's practice imposing sanctions is often called uh, police sanction, which attests to the fact that the Council is exercising a form of executive power in the international community. It is an undisputed that the International Court of Justice, ICJ, is fulfilling an important judicial function in the international community as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Then uh, the question remains, what body is exercising the legislative function in the international community? Uh, during the drafting of the Charter of the United Nations, earlier iterations of the text did not contain any reference to progressive development or codification of international law, which uh, generally refer to legislation in the international community. So we call progressive development and codification of international law uh, for legislation in the international community. The Dumbarton Oaks proposals referred only to the power of the General Assembly to, I quote, initiate studies and make recommendations for the purpose of promoting international cooperation in political, economic, and social fields, unquote. China, uh, then uh, the Republic of China, proposed extend this to the development and revision of the rules and principles of international law. Uh, which triggered discussions on whether the United Nations General Assembly 
should have legislative authority. The idea that the General Assembly should act as a world legislature was not accepted. Perhaps it was too radical at that time. However, there was a wide agreement that the General Assembly should be tasked with initiating studies and making recommendations on international law. This ultimately was enshrined in Article 13, Paragraph 1A of the Unit Charter. Uh, please look at uh, the handout, uh, which provides, I quote, the General Assembly shall initiate studies and make recommendations for the purpose of encouraging the progressive development of international law and its codification. At its first session in 1946, the General Assembly established the Sixth Committee, this is a legal committee, uh, the Sixth Committee and the Committee on the Progressive Development of International Law and its Codification. The latter committee, the Committee on the Progressive Development of International Law and its Codification, was requested by the General Assembly to consider the procedures necessary for the discharge of the, of the Assembly's responsibility under Article 13, Paragraph 1A of the Charter. In response, the committee recommended the establishment of the International Law Commission, IOC. The General Assembly, in its Resolution 174 of 21 November 1947, resolved to establish the IRC, composed of persons of recognized competence in international law. Although the IRC was established as a subsidiary organ of the General Assembly, it was ex expected to carry out its substantive functions independently. The IRC in practice still works with this degree of independence. On the other hand, Sixth Committee is one of the main committees of the General Assembly in which legal officers of the permanent missions of UN member states discuss the legal and policy views of the governments they represent. Although the IOC and Sixth Committee work separately in principle, there is considerable interaction between the two organs during all stages of the work of progressive development and codification of international law. Uh, simply put, the IOC conduct the initial drafting of articles for an eventual convention and presents them to the UN General Assembly which then decides whether they should be made a treaty by convening a diplomatic conference. The IRC was established with a membership of 15 people, the same number as that of the ICJ. However, as the membership of the United Nations has progressively increased, uh, proposals for enlargement were made and the size of the commission has thus been enlarged three times, uh, from the original 15 to 21 in 1956, from 21 to 25 in 1961, and from 25 to the present 34 in 1981. These increases assured that the statutory requirement, this is Article 8 of the IOC statute, the statutory requirement of, I quote, representation of the main forms of civilization and of the principal legal systems of the world could be achieved. In response to the same requirements, uh, there is a regional allocation system for the seat of the commission. The current allocation is eight nationals from African states, seven from Asia-Pacific states, 
uh, three from East, Eastern European states, six from Latin American and Caribbean states, and eight from West European and other states. And additionally, uh, there is one national from African or Eastern European states, and one national from Asian or Latin American states in rotation. The Commission's work generally proceeds with three stages. That is, choice of topic, first reading, and second reading. Uh, normally, initial choice of the topic is made by the Commission and recommended to the General Assembly. And after receiving input from member states in the Sixth Committee, the IRC finally decides that the subject will be taken up as a topic of the Commission, with a special, uh, normally with a special rapporteur selected to have responsibility for that topic. The Commission has currently eight topics under uh, discussion, I think, I should show you. Uh, this is uh, the same as yours, but uh, in number three, there's uh, um, eight topics, as I said, uh, currently under consideration in the IOC. Uh, they are uh, settlement of international disputes to which international organizations are parties, prevention and suppression of piracy and armed robbery at sea, Subsidiary means for the determination of rules of international law. Succession of states in respect of state responsibility. Immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction. General principles of law. Sea level rise in relation to international law. And finally, uh, non legally binding international agreements. This is uh, not currently under consensus, but uh, we will start a uh, discussion on this topic uh, from next year. Uh, these are the topics we have been uh, dealing with, including um, the one we will take up next year. Uh, at second stage, the special rapporteur presents a report uh, which is considered in the plenary of the Commission and then in the drafting committee of the commission. Uh, the result of these discussions and deliberations on first reading is present, presented to the General Assembly. The format of this outcome traditionally is draft articles with commentaries. After the first reading stage, governments are normally given one year in which to study and comment on the complete set of draft provisions and commentaries. At the third and final stage, the Commission, the IRC, considers the responses provided by government and it adjusts the earlier draft to produce the final result on second reading, which is then again presented to the General Assembly. In the past, the form of final product was normally, as I said, draft articles. If in that form, the General Assembly will determine whether they should be negotiated into a treaty. Other forms of Commission's final product include draft conclusions, draft guide or draft guidelines, and draft principles. Some representative documents in those forms include Guide to Practice on Reservations to Treaties of 2011, Conclusions on Subsequent Agreements and Subsequent Practice in Relation to the Interpretation of Treaties. This is uh, 2018. And Guiding Principles applicable to unilateral declarations of states 
capable of creating legal obligations. This is uh, 2006. However, there is no established taxonomy in this respect. So uh, members do not know what conclusions mean or uh, guidelines mean or um, principles mean. So we, we have discussions. We should have some um, definition for those different kinds of um, documents because uh, people do not understand what this means and we, we don't understand either. So this is, there is a discussion about uh, what to do with these um, different kinds of uh, products. To date, um, 23 conventions have been adopted on the basis of Commission's work, of which 19 have entered into force. Uh, this number may not seem strugglingly high, but the impact of these conventions is uh, undeniable. Among the influential conventions, there are, uh, as, as listed in, uh, under number four, um, the 1958 Geneva Conventions on the Territorial Sea and the Contiguous Zone, on the High Seas, and on the Continental Shelf. A 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, this is um, relevant to many of your the participants, but uh, this was uh, drafted by the ISC. And also uh, 1963 Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. And 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. This is a very important treaty, as you know. The period up to the end of 1960s is often referred to as the IRC's golden era because it constitutes the most productive years of the Commission's work. Uh, compared with that era, the Commission's contributions to the progress progressive development and codification of international law were measured in terms of number of international conventions adopted on the basis of its work has dwindled. Instead, the Commission's work has tended to move away from preparing draft articles as a basis of treaties preferring instead to work on a range of more diverse forms of output. Uh, this move, nonetheless, should not be seen as a sign that the Commission's impact and influence is waning. Rather, it should be viewed as responding to broader international trends. Uh, recently, there has been a broad decline in multilateral treaty negotiations and adoptions in many areas of international law, with some conspicuous uh, exceptions. For instance, uh, BBNJ um, this year. In the field of disarmament, for instance, the treaty negotiated in the Conference on Disarmament, this is the negotiating body on disarmament, uh, was the, the last one was a draft for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, CTBT, of 1996, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, this decline in new treaties has been accompanied by a rise of adoption of other types of international instruments, such as in the same field of disarmament, uh, Security Council Resolution 1887 on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. This was 20, 2009. Or guiding principles on the lethal autonomous weapons systems laws of 19, uh, 2019. In addition to such a general trend, uh, there are some other reasons for the decline in treaty-oriented work in the IRC. Indeed, there are subjects that may not suitable for future treaties. One obvious example is a text intended to elaborate or clarify the content of an existing, existing treaty, such as the guide to practice on reservations to treaties, or draft guide conclusions on subsequent agreements and subsequent practice in relation to the interpretation of treaties. 
while these are extremely useful gap-filling and clarifying instruments, it seems difficult to make them treaties, given the existence of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Those draft conclusions or guidelines, if they had been made treaties, would have caused legal problems concerning, for instance, the relationship between the parties and non-parties to the new instrument, particularly when the non-parties have the understanding of the provisions of the Vienna Convention differently from that of the parties to the, non, to the new instrument. To avoid such difficulties, it makes sense for such a sub, sub, supplementary doc, documents to the Vienna Convention to be non-legally binding. This does not discount the importance of such documents, especially given the potential or possibility of international courts and tribunals relying on them as reflective of customary international law in rendering their decisions. In the first half of next hour, I will show you what kind of gap filling functions are being performed by these supplement documents through the examination of guide to practice on reservations to treaties. Then, as a very different kind of work that IRC is performing to fulfill its mandate, particularly in response to the new challenges in the international community, I will show you what we are currently discussing within the Commission under the topic of sea level rise in, inter, uh, in relation to international law. I will move on to uh, section two. Uh, one of the most important achievements of the ISC is undoubtedly its draft articles for the 19. 69 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. It successfully codified the hitherto custom-based law of treaties and incorporated a comprehensive set of rules on treaties in one document. It took more than 15 years for the IRC to complete its work on this topic in 1966. And there were four special rapporteurs on this subject. They are James Ryrie, Hash Lauterpacht, Gerald Fitzmaurice, and Humphrey Wardock. You may know all of, all of uh, these um, eminent professors. The Vienna Convention itself was adopted after the diplomatic conference held in 1968 and 1969. Yet, the Vienna Convention is not perfect. There were several lacunas and, and insufficiencies in it. That is why the IRC has produced several supplementary documents on the law of treaties since the adoption of the Vienna Convention. Among these documents, I will take up the question of reservations. The IRC started to consider this topic in 1993 with Professor Alan Pelle as its special rapporteur, uh, which resulted in a guide to practice on reservations to treaties in 2011. So it took nearly 20 years for completion. Uh, many states complained about this <laughs> long time. The guide has clarified a number of unresolved questions from Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Nonetheless, the 2011 guide did not answer nor clarify every lingering issue. There are a few questions that remain, remain unresolved. In order to show you the difficulty of progressively developing and codifying international law, I will take up interpretative declaration as one of those issues, questions. Specifically, I will talk about, this is a 
rather a complicated uh, question, but I will talk about the legal effect of an interpretative declaration amounting to a de facto reservation made to a treaty which prohibits reservations with no parties objecting to that declaration. So I will, I will repeat because it's complicated. I will talk about the legal effect of an interpretative declaration amounting to a de facto reservation made to a treaty which prohibits reservations with no state parties objecting to that declaration. So you know how complicated the question is. Uh, since the abstract discussion of such a complicated question may be difficult to understand, I will make use of one concrete example. Uh, that is the Treaty of Tratiroko and its additional protocol two uh, of 1967. I will first give you basic information concerning the Treaty of Tratiroko and its additional protocol two, as well as the French interpretative declaration to the protocol. Uh, the French declaration is the main object of, the, of examination here. Then I will discuss the two different types of interpretative declarations in general. Followed by discussions on the distinction between reservations and interpretative declarations and how to distinguish between them. Uh, these discussions will be made by reference to the relevant provisions in the IOC's Guide to Practice on Reservations to Treaties. In the distributed reference materials, I reproduced relevant provisions of the guide. Uh, contemporane contemporaneously, I will examine and assess the legal effect of the French interpretative declaration in light of these provisions of the guide and also uh, commentaries to the guide prepared by the IRC. Uh, for context, um, Tratiroc Treaty is a nuclear weapon free zone treaty denuclearizing Latin America and the Caribbean. To date, all three, 33 regional states are party to the treaty. So this is now uh, completed. Additional Protocol 2 to the Tratiroko Treaty obligates nuclear weapon states not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapon weapons against the contracting parties to the Tratiroko Treaty. This is Article 3. The uh, use of nuclear weapons is rather um, relevant um, over the last year. But this is uh, only regional uh, Convention, denuclearizing and prohibition, prohibiting the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, all five NPT designated nuclear weapon states, that is China, Russia, uh, France, UK, and the US, are now party to the protocol. Thus, the protocol treaty, this is for regional states, and Tratiok Protocol, this is for uh, nuclear weapon states, they are different treaties, but they are intertwined. Uh, the nuclear weapon states, except China, made declarations with certain restrictive effects on their non-use undertakings under additional protocol too. France made the following interpretative declaration upon signature. I quote, uh, this is also in your handout. The French government interprets the undertaking made in Article 3 of the protocol as being without prejudice to the full exercise of the right of self-defense confirmed by Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations. Unquote. The difficult question arises here in relation to this declaration as it is prohibited to make a reservation to the Treaty of Tratiroko as well as to its protocol. If the French declaration made in relation to additional pro protocol two amounts to a reservation, then it would not be permitted under the additional protocol two. 
But if it is not amount to a reservation, it is nothing more than a simple interpreted declaration having no legal effect. If that is the case, then their full acceptance of the protocol, absolute um, prohibition of use of nuclear weapons seems to be contradictory to the fundamental security policy of the French Republic as reflected in its long-standing and consistent nuclear policy. What are the legal nature and effects of French declaration? This is a question I will address. Unlike the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which does not mention uh, interpretative declaration at all, the 2011 Guide to Practice on Reservations to Treaties does contain definition of both reservations and interpretative declarations. Uh, regarding reservations, it provides for a definition essentially the same as that in the Vienna Convention. Uh, as you see in the handout, the guideline 1.1 provides that reservations, reservation means a unilateral statement, however phrased or named, made by a state when signing, ratifying a treaty whereby the state purports to exclude or to modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty in their application to the state. Concerning interpretative declarations, the guide provides in guideline 1.2 that interpretative declaration means a unilateral statement, however phrased or named, made by a state, whereby that state purports to specify or clarify the meaning or scope of a treaty or of certain of its provisions. There are no surprising elements in these definitions. From our perspective, we are interested in the relationship and distinction between reservations and interpretative declarations. But before proceeding to that point, we will see the different types of interpretative declarations. According to the IRC's commentaries to the guide to practice, uh, there are two types of interpretative declarations. There are simple, declara uh, simple interpretative declarations on the one hand and conditional interpretative declarations on the other. The former type of declarations, that is uh, simple declar interpretative declarations, are those unilateral statements formulated by a state which does not make its interpretation a condition for participation in the treaty. In other words, the declaring state would become a party even if its declared interpretation is not accepted. In this sense, simple interpretative declarations to which general term interpretative declaration typically refers, so normally interpretative declaration means simple interpretative declaration, but these interpretative declarations do not really have legal effects. On the other hand, the latter type of declarations, that is conditional interpretative declarations, are those unilateral statements formulated by a state whereby the state subject its consent to be bound by the treaty to a specific interpretation of the treaty. This type of inter interpretative declaration is defined by the guide to practice in guideline 1.4, uh, this is again in your handout, uh, 1.4 paragraph one, as follows. A, a conditional interpretative declaration is a unilateral statement formulated by a state when signing, etc., whereby the state subjects its consent to be bound by the treaty to a specific interpretation of a treaty or of certain provisions thereof. 
the guide further provides that conditional interpreted declarations are subject to the rules applicable to reservations. This is uh, Rajan 1.4, paragraph 2. So conditional interpretative declarations are subject to the rules applicable to the reservations. Thus, simply put, conditional interpretative declarations are, in fact, reservations. Whereas simple interpretative declarations are declarations not having the legal effect of reservations. So there are clear differences between these two different kinds of interpretative declarations. The question that arises in this connection is how one can distinguish between simple interpretative declarations and conditional interpretative declarations, i.e. reservations, that are made are in relation to a treaty prohibiting reservations, like the case of a treaty of Tratrok and its additional protocol too. So the question is, uh, how to distinguish between simple interpreted declarations and conditional interpreted declarations, that is, uh, reservations, that are made in relation to a treaty prohibiting reservations. On this question, the guide in guideline 1.3.3 stipulates that, again, in the handouts, when a treaty prohibits reservations, a unilateral statement formulated by states shall be presumed not to constitute a reservation. But at the same time, it also provides in the same guideline that such a statement nevertheless constitutes a reservation if it purports to exclude or modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty. Thus, the characterization of a unilateral statement as either a simple interpreted declaration or conditional interpreted declaration amounting to a reservation seems to turn on the intention of its author. Now, uh, coming back to the French declaration made in relation to Tratural Protocol 2, uh, since the protocol provides for a flat and unconditional prohibition of the use of nuclear weapons in Article 3, as we saw, the French declaration would constitute a reservation if it, if it purports to modify the legal effect of that provision. In its declaration, France has claimed the, the right to use nuclear weapons in the case of self-defense and seems to have made its statement a condition for its adherence to the protocol. Such an intention was additionally made clear at the time France made its declaration. After declaring that its undertaking not to use nuclear weapons is without prejudice to the full exercise of the right of self-defense, France added as follows. Again, this is in the hand note, uh, handout. I quote, if the interpreted declaration thus made by the French, uh, French government is contested in whole or in part by one or more contracting parties to the treaty or to protocol two, the set instruments shall be without effect in relations between the French Republic and the contesting state or states. It is clear that France has subjected its consent to be bound by additional protocol two to its declaration. This is also the view of the IRC. The commentary on guideline 1.4 refers to this part of French declaration as something, I quote, indisputably indicating the conditional nature of the declaration. If so, what is the legal effect of such declarations? Conditional interpretative declarations amounting to reservations made to a treaty in which reservations are prohibited. Concerning the legal effect of such prohibited declarations, uh, sorry, prohibited reservations, the guide to practice provides as follows. 
again uh, look at uh, handout. First, the guideline 3.3.1, it is provided that a reservation formulated notwithstanding a prohibition is impermissible. Then, in guideline 4.5.1, it is also provided that a reservation that does not meet the conditions of formal validity and permissibility is null and void. So impermissible reservation is null and void, and therefore devoid of any legal effect. The guide further stipulates in guideline 4.5.2, just to be sure that, quote, the nullity of an invalid reservation does not depend on the objection or acceptance by a contracting state. In short, a prohibited reservation is impermissible and is therefore not on the void even if it is accepted by another contracting state. It is rather uh, easy to understand. But at the same time, it is to be noted that there are some other related and very important from our perspective provisions in the guide. That is guideline 3.3.3, entitled absence of effects of individual acceptance of a reservation on the permissibility of the reservation. A rather long title, but it's important. That guideline 3.3.3 provides that, it quote, acceptance of an impermissible reservation by a contracting state shall not affect the impermissibility of the reservation. Notwithstanding the apparent unequivocal statement in this provision, it is noteworthy that the title of the provision includes the qualifying word individual before acceptance, implying that collective rather than individual acceptance might have a different effect. So to repeat the title, guideline 3.3.3 refers to absence of effect of individual acceptance of a reservation on the permissibility of the reservation. In fact, the IRC's commentary on that guideline, uh, guideline 3.3.3, states in paragraph 6, again, uh, look at the uh, um, handout. In paragraph 6, the commenter states that individual acceptance of an impermissible reservation has no effect as such on the consequence of this impermissibility. Again, uh, you should um, note that there is a word as such. Uh, accept, uh, individual acceptance of an in, impermissible reservation has no effect as such. This is a kind of a, an addition. Um, there's not an um, absolute statement on the consequence of this impermissibility. While it continues to state in paragraph 8 that the question remains, however, whether collective acceptance of an otherwise impermissible reservation is possible question remains whether corrective acceptance is possible. And then uh, paragraph 10, um, the commentary discuss the possibility of interpreting such an event as a general or unanimous agreement constituting an, agree uh, an amendment to the reservation clause. The commentary stops short of enunciating a definite conclusion on this question by saying in paragraph 13 that it is better not to take a position on the question which in any event has more to do with the general problem of amendment or modification of treaties than that of reservation strict or sense. So this is a kind of um, avoid uh, um, clear uh, answer to this question. So there is a kind of nuance that uh, collective acceptance of impermissible reservation may be 
accepted as valid. In my view, it might be possible to take the position that a collective or unanimous acceptance of an impermissible reservation could be tantamount to an agreement to amend or modify the provision prohibiting reservations in relation to that particular reservation. As it is said that the parties always have the right to amend the treaty by agreement unless it is contrary to the preemptory norms of general international law or otherwise prohibited by the treaty or other international law. So um, my view is uh, uh, that um, Unlike the IRC, unlike, um, uh, the, the IRC stopped short of uh, stating uh, clearly that um, the collective acceptance of um, impermissible reservation is possible and it may be valid, but I think this is um, true. But a caution should be exercised here, not to confuse this amendment with the amendment of treaty in its ordinary sense because uh, this is a case where the parties to a treaty agreed to derogate from its provisions only in relation to a particular, sta a particular state or a particular state. In, in that sense, um, amendment or modification might not be most appropriate term to explain the situation. Uh, we should remember that procedural requirements are provided both amendment and uh, uh, modification. Perhaps a special treatment of a particular case would explain the situation more precisely. Uh, the precedent often referred to as a similar situation is the neutrality reservation made by Switzerland to the covenant of the League of Nations. The covenant of the League of Nations prohibits reservations in Article 1. Our first international organization embodying a collective security system, the League of and its covenant obliges or obliged members to afford passage through their territory to the forces participating in military sanctions. However, Switzerland made her accession to the League conditional upon the passing of a resolution recognizing the inviolability of her territory and prohibiting military passage through its territory. The incompatibility involved was apparent and was clearly recognized by the members, but the Council of the League acquiesced in the Swiss reservation and permitted Switzerland to limit her obligation to participate in sanctions. Unlike Swiss case, the case before us does not involve an express acceptance of a reservation, but rather an absence of objections by other states to the French interpreted declaration. In the case of normal re reservation procedure, it is provided in uh, Article 20, Paragraph 5 of Vienna Convention that, uh, again, this is uh, in the handout, uh, a reservation is considered to have been accepted by a state if it shall have raised no objection to the reservation by the end of period of 12 months after it was notified of the reservation. Why well, it is inconceivable that the rules applicable to normal reservations applies to the present case of impermissible reservation, it is still may not reasonably be argued that state party can object to an impermissible reservation any time after many years of silence. We can't expect that a state party can object to an impermissible reservation any time after many years of um, notification. If such is allowed, the stability of the treaty relations and expectation of the declaring state to consider that its declarations are somewhat accepted would be greatly damaged. In other words, it would not be un uh, unreasonable for a declaring state to consider that its impermissible reservation 
has been acquiesced by others in the absence of any specified objections to it for decades. Indeed, according to the ICJ's jurisprudence, silence or failure to respond to sometimes produces certain legal effects, even in relation to the title to a territory. I'm referring to the Petrobranca case judgment of 2008. So my conclusion on this question would be that the French interpretative declaration made to the Treaty of Tratrico and uh, Tratrico Protocol 2 is not without legal effect, and that that effect would be very close to the case of valid reservations. Now, I turn to the second concrete example of the IRC's work, which is currently under uh, discussion under the topic of sea level rise in relation to international law. Uh, this topic is noteworthy in terms of how it was selected by the IRC. Regarding topic selection generally, the IRC's working group in 1997 adopted the following criteria for the selection of new topics for the Commission. A, the topics should reflect the needs of states in respect, in respect of progressive development and codification of international law. B, the topic should be sufficiently advanced in stage in terms of state practice to permit progressive development and codification. And C, the topic is concrete and feasible for pro progressive development and, and codification. And in addition, it is also recommended that, I quote, the commission should not restrict itself to traditional topics but could also consider those that reflect new developments in international law and pressing concerns of the international community as a whole. Pressing concerns of the international community as a whole, unquote. A sea level rise is exactly the kind of topic mentioned in the recommendation of the working group as it involves pressing concerns of the international community as a whole. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, its report of nine, uh, 2019, global mean sea level rise was an estimated 1.1 meters maximum by the end of 2,100, uh, uh, estimated 100, oh, sorry, estimated 1.1 meters maximum by the end of uh, 2,100. While this would have the most serious impact on small island countries, particularly those in South Pacific, changes would not be limited to all those not uh, only uh, those countries. It is said that the direct impact of sea level rise will be extended to over 70 states around the world, of course, including Japan. Uh, we can distinguish between two kinds of problems that a sea level rise will likely to cause to land and sea. Uh, one is the regression of coastlines, uh, regression of coastlines of states. And the other is the submergence or disappearance of maritime features. While they produce different kinds of problems, they are both related to the international law of the sea in, in one way or another. The regression of the coastlines may lead to the landward shift of the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea, contiguous zones, exclusive economic zones, EEZ, and continent shelves are measured. 
as Article 5 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea provides, I think this is in, in the handout, uh, number three, Article 5 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS provides that NOVA baseline is the low water line along the coast. A landward shift of baselines means that former internal waters may become territorial sea. Former territorial sea may become EZ. And former EZ and continent shelf may become the high seas and seabed. These changes may not look very serious because the size of each water zone may well be almost the same before and after sea level rise occurs. The difference may only be in terms of their locations, generally moving towards the land. However, if you look at the land territory, seabed, and their subsoil, sea level rise will undoubtedly cause losses of land mass for the coastal states. In addition, such shift of locations might also result in a huge loss in investment. For instance, if the coastal state invested in the development of the continent shelf for extracting natural resources, and if the invested areas later become submerged and part of the deep seabed due to sea level rise, it may face significant financial losses. However, a much more drastic change for the coastal states would arise in cases where the maritime features are inundated and ultimately submerged. According to the UNCLOS, there are three different kinds of maritime features. Islands, rocks, and low tide elevations. Each of these categories of features has different maritime zones around them. First, islands have a full range of maritime zones, just like the mainland. That is, territorial sea, contiguous zone, EZ, and continental shelf. Second, rocks have territorial sea and contiguous zone, but do not generate EZ or continental shelf. Lastly, low tide elevations may have its own territorial sea and contiguous zone on condition that it is located in the territorial sea of the coastal state. However, low tide elevations not meeting such a condition do not have any maritime zones. While it is relatively easy to physically discern the difference between the island rock on the one hand and a low tide elevation on the other. As the latter is only above the sea at low tide and submerged at high tide. Determining whether a feature is an island or rock can be more challenging. Rocks refer to maritime features that are always above the sea but are uninhabitable or unable to sustain their own economic life. The relevant provision, uh, provisions of the UNCLOS provides as follows. Uh, again, uh, see the uh, handout. Concerning islands, Article 121, Paragraph 2 provides that except as provided for in Paragraph 3, the territorial sea, contiguous zone, and the exclusive economic zone, and the continent shelf of an island are determined in accordance with the provisions of this convention applicable to other land territory. For rocks, paragraph three provides that rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continent shelf. For low tide elevations, Article 13 
provides that where low tide elevation is situated wholly or partly at a distance not exceeding the breadth of the Tetio Sea from mainland or an island, the low tide, uh, sorry, low water line on that elevation may be used as a baseline for, measure, for measuring the best dutters breadth of Tetio Sea. In paragraph two said, where a low tide elevation is wholly situated at a distance exceeding the breadth of the territorial sea from the mainland or the island, it has no territorial sea of its own. Now, what would happen if sea level rise causes inundation or submergence of maritime features? If inundation of an island makes it inhabitable, sorry, in, uh, uninhabitable, that island will no longer be regarded as an island but a lock, whereby it will lose its EZ and continental shelf, which may, depending on its location and size, amount to a loss of sovereign rights over more than 400,000 square kilometers in space. 400,000 square kilometers. If the island becomes a low tide elevation, located outside the territorial sea of the mainland or completely submerged, it will lose all the maritime zones around it, including some 1,500 square kilometer territorial sea, again, depending on its size and location. This is not an abstract possibility or a simple calculation. For instance, it is said that by spontaneously changing the legal status of rock oil from an island to a rock, Britain lost some 60,000 square kilometer of fishery zone. Indonesia's National Research and Innovation Agency has projected that at least 115 of its islands will be underwater by the year 2100. One further drastic change that could take place due to sea level rise is that if one of the base points to draw the archipelagic baseline is submerged, that may result in a situation where two of the archipelagic baselines which had used that point would have to be withdrawn. And as a result, and in, in extreme cases, the newly redrawn baselines might not specify all the requirements for the archipelagic baselines. Please look at Article um, 47. Um, the requirement includes the ratio of water versus land to be between 1 to 1 and 9 to 1, meaning that in that case, the state would lose the whole the whole archipelagic waters. In the most extreme cases, if a small island country loses all its inhabitable islands, a question may be even arise if the country satisfies the requirement of statehood. Article 1 of the Mont uh, Montevideo Convention provides that the state, as a person of international law, should possess four qualifications, which include a defined territory. If an island country loses all of its inhabitable islands, its qualifications as a state may be questioned. I'm not going to this question further, but it is a real question, considering that the average height of the Maldives 1,300 islands is one to 1.5 meters. And as I said, uh, the projection is, sea level rise projection is 1.1 meter uh, uh, rise by, uh, by 2100. These are all pessimistic outlooks of sea level rise in relation to international law. On the other hand, concerning the regression of baselines, 
there is a tendency that more and more states support the fixed baseline approach, which considers despite the regression of coastlines, the baselines are fixed, rather than the ambulatory baseline approach, which considers that baselines change as the coastlines change. Thus, the states tend to be in favor of the view that despite sea level rise and consequent change of coastlines, the impacted state will, rain, will maintain their original maritime zones and entitlements without any, any diminishing effects. This fact is welcome development for the ultimate solution to the problem posed by sea level rise. Still, a difficult question remains concerning as of, as of when the baseline should be fixed. On this question, a proposal was made and support is growing that the charts or list of geographical coordinates deposited with the United Nations should be utilized. The uncross in Article 16 obligates, this again uh, in the Yes, uh, there's in the hand, hand, hand out. Um, Article 16 obligates states parties to deposit the charts and the list of coordinates with the United Nations. The idea is to fix the baselines as of the date of that deposit. As UNCLOS does not require states parties to regularly update the charts. And fortunately, many states subject to this obligation have in fact deposited the charts with the United Nations, including Japan. However, another question remains. If the charts deposited could be legally used for the baseline fixing purposes, because the deposit rule is primarily for the purpose of publicity and the safety of navigation, while the depiction of baselines or maritime zones is supplementary function. Moreover, a more serious legal question remains as to why such a procedural system as a deposit with the United Nations can constitute the legal basis for the substantive rights to maritime zones or even maritime sovereignty. Furthermore, it may be asked whether using the deposit date as a cutoff date is logical because the date on which a state deposit is in a sense accidental as no deadline is stipulated in the convention. It is more important to note that the mandatory deposit is formally required only in relation to straight baselines, river mouths and bays, archipelagic baselines, exclusive economic zones, continental shelves, but significantly not for normal baselines. There is no obligation to deposit uh, charts or coordinates in the case of normal baselines. This fact incidentally indicates the deposit system is not introduced for the depiction of baselines. For that was, for uh, that, if that was the case, normal baseline should have been part of it. With the no, normal baselines not being covered by the deposit system, the significant part of the question posed by sea level rise regarding the regression of coastlines may not be resolved through this procedure. Uh, what should we do? One way of addressing this question would be to adopt a resolution at a meeting of state parties to the UNCLOS and subsequently at the UN General Assembly to the effect that states are encouraged to deposit charts indicating their normal baselines as part of the overall resolution of the issue. This is an idea put forward by myself and others at the IOC. But the legal value of such a non-legally binding instrument may be questioned. My idea is that meeting of state parties of the UNCLOS could agree and adopt a resolution embodying 
the concept of fixed baselines and other limits of maritime zones as an interpretation of ANCOS. As a commentary to the co conclusions on subsequent agreement and subsequent practice clearly states, such subsequent agreements need not be legally binding. In fact, there are precedents of resolutions that de facto amendment was made in regard to some provisions of ANCRUS, such as those concerning the deferment of first election of ITROS judges and of the deadlines for submission of information on the limits of continental shelf beyond 200 miles. Moreover, it is also advisable in order to cover non-parties to the UNCLOS to adopt a UN General Assembly resolution to the same effect as a declaration of rules of customary international law and its interpretation. Another difficult question that may arise as a result of the complete submergence of maritime features is how this would relate to the principle of the land dominates the sea. If the island disappears due to sea level rise, but the maritime zones still remain, then those zones would become enclaves in the high seas without any features. From a practical point of view, this could force pose significant difficulty for other states in terms of navigation, fisheries, and other maritime activities. From a legal point of view, it would, be, it would contradict the principle of the land dominate the sea. Could there be any maritime zones without any land accompanied? This is a question. There are arguments in the RC that the principle of the land dominates the sea is not a rule of international law, but a mere maxim created by the ICJ in the 1969 North Sea Continental Shelf Judgment. It is also stated that there is no treaty which has codified that principle, unlike the natural prolongation of land territories in the case of continental shelf. On the other hand, it has been pointed out in the IOC that this principle is not provided in any treaties or conventions because it is too self-evident to provide in a treaty. In any event, if we are to adhere to the principle of the land dominates the sea and thus argue that the maritime zone will disappear with the disappearance of the maritime features, while at the same time we were to adopt a fixed baseline option with regard to change of coastlines, we would have to justify such a differentiated and inconsistent treatment between the disappearance of uh, maritime features and um, baseline change. This appears very difficult because uh, both involves similar legal fictions. These are all difficult legal questions, even if we agree to the fixed baselines and base points approach. And IRC is now being struggling to find a solution, and eventually the international community will have to find its final solution. Uh, in this presentation, I have shown you the history of international legislation, the structure and functions of uh, the IRC, and the Commission's works. For the International Law Commission's works, I have taken up the topics of reservations and interpreted declarations. And um, I also talked about the sea level rise in relation to the law of, treat, uh, law of the sea. I hope um, this has hope helped you to understand um, the works of uh, the IRC, and uh, I would be very happy if this um, interests you somewhat. Thank you very much.